stay hungry, stay foolish. Did you know learning is a skill? Did you know that learning to learn stuff better is much easier once you know how? There are dozens of ways to improve your ability to learn more stuff in less time that you can apply immediately. Today's show might be just what you need. By using these simple but effective methods, you will improve your capacity to learn, understand more, and remember for longer. Avoid wasting more time studying and start getting the most out of your education by picking out your favorite top study tips and start learning stuff better right now. We welcome author of 23 Tips to Learn Stuff Better so you can spend less time studying and more time enjoying yourself. Ian Gibbs, welcome to the show. Good morning, Aiden. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the show, man. I really enjoyed the book. I don't mind sharing with the audience that you made me work twice as hard this week. I read the book for the authors we interview every single week, and we did a prep call on Tuesday to just make sure the tech was working, etc. And then you said, Aiden, maybe you'll change from reading The Sorites Principle, which was your former book, and jump onto this horse, which is 23 tips to learn stuff better. So we worked twice as hard this week, man. I, I do apologize for that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what really sold me actually on it was when you started telling me about the concept behind the book that this is a book that you wish somebody wrote and got in a time machine and went back in time and gave you back in the past. That's right, yeah. I was thinking of myself during my university days and the problems that I had and the frustrations that I, I felt. This was just what what I needed. This is me talking to myself 30 years ago. This isn't just for... A student, this is for the way the workplace has changed and evolved so much that we need to learn all the time. In the workplace, people need to learn constantly to evolve, to reinvent, and it's going to get even faster and faster. So that's really why I went, absolutely, let's jump into this book. So before we get to the tips, let's share this concept of the Sorites Principle, seeing as I've read it as well, because it does, in a way, work really well, and it segues well with 23 Tips. The constant application of insignificant actions when coherently focused will inevitably lead to dramatic, significant results. I'd love if you shared a bit about that, Ian. Sure, absolutely. We all know, everybody, all your listeners know that doing things constantly makes progress. Doing a few exercises every day gets you fit. Uh, not eat, or reducing the amount that you, that you eat every day helps you lose weight. And yet, even though we know it, so few people actually do it. And if small actions every day are so easy to do and so effective, then why is it that most of us fail, and I'm including myself here, why is it that we fail to follow through doing these small yet powerful actions that could really get us to where we want. And so I investigated the problems that we have with this, the distractions, the way that we fail to actually appreciate the importance of something which is apparently trivial or insignificant. And I looked at all the different tricks or techniques that successful people have in applying these things, and I divided them into approximately eight categories and put all these tips and tricks together in, in this book. It basically is a way of helping yourself do whatever those little things are that you need to do every day to get where you want to get. You mentioned at the end of 23 Tips, there's five basic steps to learning because I know there's more, but if you want to go deep into learning, there's more, but you mentioned the five. And I thought this was really helpful just to frame the book before we get into the 23 Tips themselves. The five basic steps, the first step, and actually this is a major problem that people have or a major misunderstanding. The first step is being aware of stuff. What I mean by that is that when we read a book or attend a lecture or watch something on YouTube, whatever, we are 
told about stuff. We receive information and we become aware of it. We recognize it. And one of the problems is that often we misunderstand, we, we mistake being aware of something, recognizing it for learning. We're amazingly good at recognizing stuff. The picture that I was getting in my head is when I was a teacher and I would say to my students, right, okay, we're going to do algebra. And they would say, oh, we've already done algebra. Because when they look at it in the book, they recognize it. But the problem is, is that simply recognizing stuff isn't learning it. It's, it's the, the, the simplest type of learning that there is. For instance, when I, when I give my talks to adults rather than students, I use the reference of seven habits of highly effective people. I say, right, okay, so put your hands up if you've read the book and, you know, about over half the audience put their hand on. I say, right, turn to your partner, turn to somebody who hasn't read the book and tell them what the seven tips are. And almost nobody in the audience can actually say with certainty what the seven tips are. They've read the book, they recognize it, but can they remember it? The answer is no, they can't. And so above simple awareness, recognition, is the ability to remember, to recall stuff, to be able to bring it back into your, your consciousness without any prompts or without any help. This is, is one of the things that I think we, we fail to do ourselves, is, is to actually learn to remember stuff, to be able to recall it. A simple way to be able to remember stuff better is just try to remember it. The simple method of flashcards. You can get flashcard apps now on your mobile phone where you have one side that prompts you and the other side gives the answer. Just try and do that every day. If there's stuff that you need to remember, then try to remember it often. It's like practicing riding a bicycle or swimming. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And I do this not just with facts and figures, but I'm terrible at remembering, or I used to be terrible at remembering people's names. With the flashcard app that I, that I use, I use one called Anki app, which I think is great. You can put photos. So I'll put you know, photos of the people whose names I want to remember, and then you, you flip it over and voila, you can see that you're rubbish at remembering it still, or you, you, you get through it, but it works. You're trying to remember, and therefore, eventually, you get it. Without any special techniques or memory tips, it's just trying to do it. The more you try to do it, the better you get at it. Simple as that. The next level up from remembering stuff is to be able to understand it. You might remember the names of people, but if you don't understand who they are, what responsibilities they've got, who's friends with who, who's married to who, who likes what, etc., you, you don't get that interconnectedness of the, the facts. The simplest way of starting to understand stuff is to talk about it. By discussing your ideas with other people, you get to shuffle all these facts around and see how they start to slot together. And when you're trying to explain something to somebody and you realize that you're having difficulty that's when you, you find out that, that there's something that you don't understand. Because if you can't put it into words simply, if you can't fluidly express your thoughts, then obviously there's some connections there that aren't working. I write a weekly blog, the Thursday Thought blog, and one of the best things about it is it teaches you what you know and what you don't know for that exact reason. You have to comprehend it. And if you're going to put it out there into the world, you need to be able to stand over your comprehension of it, but it also aids in the comprehension of it. So you need to fill the gaps where you yourself don't know. When I read this, this is why I thought this was so important. Mostly you kind of go, ah, oh, yeah, I know that. And that's the recognition almost part. And then by actually dissecting it and trying to rebuild it, and as you say, connect the dots between different concepts, that's when you actually get to really bring it inside and it sticks, bits of it stick that way. 
And I find that really, really important. I think writing is such a great way to learn. You're using bits of your brain that you don't no normally use when you're just accepting information or when you're thinking about it. I don't understand the neuroscience of this, but what, it, what is very clear is that when you have to, have to give an output, a verbal output, or even a written output, the way that your brain processes the information, I think, is, is different from when you're just sitting at your desk thinking about things. It, it gives clarity to, to your thoughts. Then the next step is evaluation. Evaluation, yeah, which is the, the idea of actually putting the ideas into effect. It, it's the doing stuff. It's uh, applying the theory to reality. Because when you go out there and do stuff with the ideas, you're applying the theory of what you've learned to the reality. And that immediately gives you another, another dimension to what it is that you're learning. You know, you can explain, for instance, to somebody how you would go to a restaurant in Germany and order dinner. And that's nice in theory. But to actually go to a restaurant in Germany and order dinner, you might find, I'm sure you would find, that there's lots of things in real terms that you haven't covered in the theory. And it's the, it's the doing stuff with your, your knowledge that helps you consolidate your understanding and understand it even better. These four levels, they're, they're not black and white. For instance, when, when you start learning a bicycle, you learn a bicycle by actually getting on the thing and trying to do it from scratch. You don't sit down and get on the internet and, and read a couple of pages on how to ride a bicycle. It's not you start here and then you go up to there and then you go up to there. There are definite stages of learning which sometimes we often is ignored when we're trying to learn stuff ourselves. I think that's a really important point also for business because we talk about this all the time, that you need to get some product out in the market to learn from it. If you just have a theory of, oh, I think this will work, the market really wants it, you may totally be wrong, but just getting something out there quickly, learning from the mistakes, learning what works, what doesn't work from actual the scar tissue is a much more valuable learning. Now, it doesn't mean alone, as you say, it's not just the scar tissue you need. You need both the theory and the scar tissue together. To an extent, it's, it's a bit like playing around. For instance, an example which has happened since I spoke to you on Tuesday, I don't know whether I'm really behind the times or not. I'm, I'm not the most technologically minded person that you're going to be interviewing. But I've just been introduced to an app called Slack. I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. So this this was new for me. And man, uh, man you're you're so you're so 2016, 2015, <laughs> man. <laughs> you gotta oh. listen to the old shows, man. Right, okay. Oh. Right. This, this right. interview's over, Ian. It's over. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, so I had I had to learn how, how to, to use this thing. And so all I did is is I I, I looked at a, a few YouTube explanations of the basic thing and so I, I became aware and i started to to try and understand what it is that but basically the the way that i learned it was just playing around with it just doing the stuff that uh that that i saw on the explanation and from my my workmates are saying that i should be using this but it was is just getting out and doing doing it and not being afraid to make a mess of it because I think one of the problems that we have with learning is that we're frightened of of getting it wrong. We're we're frightened of making a mess. The, is, you can't you can't learn stuff well unless you're relaxed and you're open to these ideas. It's the opposite of fight and flight. This idea that when you're tense, you know, and you're full of your adrenaline is pumped up, you're ready for action. The opposite end is this rest and digest idea that when you're relaxed and comfortable that's when your brain is open to taking on board new ideas and new concepts 
And we do that when we play. And so this idea of setting aside a period of time where you say, look, I'm going to go and have a go at learning this. And I might not get it right. I'm probably going to make a few mistakes. But what the hell? It's all part of the learning process. And so this idea of applying stuff and expecting to not get it perfect is is an important part of progressing. There's a, a very simple quote by Benny Lewis, a language learning guru. He's a polyglot, learns loads of languages really quickly. He says that if you're 100% sure of getting it right, then you're not trying hard enough. You're not trying to learn quickly. You're not stretching yourself. And he points out that, that uh, when he's learning a new language, he expects to be making mistakes, more than 100 mistakes a day when he's communicating with people because that way you, you're, you're trying stuff that you don't know how to do yet. You're pushing the boundaries, and it's only in that area of chaos that you learn that the order comes. You have to be in the chaos zone in order for the order to come. And actually, I'm going to jump ahead to one of the tips here because – this segues well with the story of Mike Boyd and the tip. It's tip number 21, which is do it again. Yeah, I love Mike Boyd. He's brilliant. Mike Boyd has this YouTube channel called What I Learned to Do Today. And he accepts ch challenges to learn stuff. He tends to be more f physical stuff, axe throwing, dice stacking, and spinning a basketball. He films himself. He starts day one, hour zero, and he records himself trying and trying and trying until eventually he can do it. And he see, you know, how long does it take to actually learn how to do some of these things? And the one that I refer to in the book is, is the basketball one. And with, with a lot of video editing, because the actual video on YouTube, I think is about 10 minutes long, but it takes him about four and a half hours of continuous practice to learn how to spin a basketball on your finger for more than 30 seconds. That was the, the, the challenge that he gave himself. Learn how to spin a basketball on your finger for 30 seconds. And, of course, if you do the maths, if you say, well, it takes you about 10 seconds to, to, to try to spin the basketball, it falls on the floor because obviously you can't do it and then pick it up and try again. If it takes about 10 seconds to do that, then Mike Boyd failed about 1,600 times. 1,600 fails before he manages to get it. Now, most people, when they try to do something, they might fail once or five times or 10 times. But by about the 20th time, and I'm particularly thinking of my own children here, we think, if I can't do it after 20 times, then obviously I can't do it. So I might as well give up. Because this idea of failing at 20 times, we absorbed this idea from society that if we fail at something, therefore we're not good at it. And if we're not good at it, then we can't learn it and we can't get better, which is complete rubbish. Because I honestly think that most people can actually do most things. It's not that somebody is great at doing mathematics and somebody else isn't. It's just that it's a self-perpetuating, it's a, it's a vicious circle. If you believe that you're good at doing something, then you're more likely to do it, which means you're more likely to get better at it which means you will be better at it, which means you've fulfilled your own prophecy. And exactly the same thing the other way around. If you think that you're going to be bad at something, then you're less likely to put in the effort, which means that compared to those that do, you're not going to be as good. So you can sit there and say, I told you I was going to be rubbish at learning German or coding or spinning a basketball or whatever. Going back to the Sorites principle, if you continue to practice something every day, even if it's just for a few minutes every day, you are inevitably going to get better at it. I've got so many examples of this and how helping people get over this barrier of 
I can't learn this can produce some amazing results. But I think one of the most important things as far as learning goes is having the attitude that, yes, I can learn this. I will be able to do it. I am a capable person because, for instance, when I was a, when I was a student before university, I had to do Spanish. And I hated Spanish at the time. I'm pretty fluent in Spanish now. I, bizarrely, completely ironic. But at the time, I studied Spanish for two years. And when I did my O-level exam, I think I got the lowest qualification in the history of the school, if not the county. I failed spectacularly my Spanish exam because I was convinced that I couldn't learn Spanish. I thought, what's the point? I'm rubbish at it. I'm not a linguist. I can't do this. And I, I got a really bad grade because I, I never put in the effort. I, I never thought that I would be a capable Spanish speaker. And now I'm fluent, so I've obviously proved myself wrong now. That's a really important point about the things we say to people, both as mentors or leaders or business leaders or parents, is so important. So if we drop in ideas like, oh, there's only certain types of people who are good at languages and other people are good at science. If we're saying those type of things into society, into the world, that's not very helpful. Yeah. It's called the Pygmalion effect is when you kind of influence somebody towards a positive outcome. And it's called the Gollum effect. The opposite is when you're kind of going, oh, well, I'm no good at this, so I'm going to be you know, good at this. And then they actually just fulfill their own prophecy, as you say. It's one of the reasons I, I really love the idea of the book. You do aim it at you know, students, but I think it's so valid for us. We're, it's not too late for us as C-suite executives, CEOs, entrepreneurs, to actually take on a lot of the lessons that you talked about in the book. It's strange. I mean, I'm stunned. I aim this at university students, but yet from primary students to adult students, everybody who's, who's read the book has said how much it's helped them modify or change their approach to learning stuff. My niece is called Cadence. She's 12 years old before the book came out. And I, I gave the, a draft of the book to my family to read. And they actually gave the, the manuscript to Cadence as well, and she read it. And she was about to start secondary school. Up until starting secondary school as a student, she'd been a completely normal, run-of-the-mill student. You know, never shone for doing anything spectacular. She started secondary school at the end of August. In her first week, she got a certificate of excellence from her teacher saying how pleased they were with the standard of her work. And this, you know, this is nice, but as she pointed out, the, the teacher has actually got a wad of these certificates in her desk drawer that she just gives out to anybody who does good stuff. But nevertheless, in one week, first week at school, this like made her think, oh, I'm doing something good. The following month, the quality of her homework was so good that her teacher took a photograph of it and put it on the school website to demonstrate the quality of what could be achieved by students. And this was something that the, the teacher didn't do for everybody. This was something quite unusual, you know, that she shows the work of a student to the whole school. And so, again, this increased Cadence's self-confidence and attitude. And so she continued applying the techniques, etc. A month later in October, Cadence got a letter from the director of the school, the headmaster, congratulating her on the standard of her work and the quality that she was producing and how much he was looking forward to seeing what Cadence was going to be capable of producing over the, the coming years. The last time the director had written a, a letter to a student congratulating that student on the quality of the work was seven years ago. 
you know, it's mind blowing to a 12 year old child to get a letter of commendation from the headmaster. She's completely changed her attitude. She goes to school now, and if she if she's not in the top of the class, she feels frustrated because she knows that she's capable of producing excellent work. Since then, she's won Student of the Year Award, Homework of the Year Award. I think she's getting a bit bored with all these, these prizes that she wins. It's so great, and it's so frustrating at the same time because what Cadence has seen is that there are ways of learning stuff better than if you just left to get on with it yourself. And the frustrating thing is, is that everybody could have this. I hear it, man. I hear you. When you told me about this book when I was reading Sartes, this is what jumped out to me is like, let's at least get this out there where people can start thinking about that for themselves, but also their children or their niece or nephew, whatever, just to get it out into society. We're going to run out of time. So will we jump into the tips? Because uh, the, the last of the fa- five basic steps was mastery. So let's just leave that. It went recognition, recollection, comprehension, evaluation, and mastery. But the first tip you talk about really works well with what Cadence did here. And that is she owned it. Yeah. First thing, the first thing that nobody actually tells people is that you have to own your responsibility of learning. That learning is an action which only you can do. You can give something to someone. You can show something to someone. You can read something to someone, but you can't learn something to someone. You have to do it yourself. You can't learn somebody something. And this is a problem. When you say it like this, people say, oh, yeah, that's obvious. You know, blah, 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 blah. But the problem is we don't think that because we think that you can learn somebody something except that we don't use that expression. We say it's teaching. We think that a teacher teaches people stuff. If you get a, from the business point of view, if you get a company, if you get an in-company trainer come to to your company and teach you, then we think that by having that trainer there come in and teaching you whatever it is or training you, being in the same room and listening to what the, the trainer is saying, that's going to teach us stuff. We are going to learn because that person is learning us something. And it's so wrong that you have to put in the effort yourself. You have to be actively trying to get this stuff which the teacher or trainer is presenting to you. You have to make the effort to learn it yourself. And the problem is, is that our default mode of attending sessions like this is to passively sit there and listen to the stuff pour over us. And we think, well, we're going to get it just by listening or by making a few notes. And this is so wrong because, you know, I've, I, I know myself included that I've been to training sessions and then. Two months afterwards, the progress that's been made is zero. You just think because you've you've attended, then you've you've learned, and it's not. You have to make the effort to learn actively, learn the stuff yourself. And this is the same in the workplace. This is the same as owning your career. Nobody's sitting up in the HQ, sitting there and kind of going, "Wonder what we're going to do next, Raid McCullen, to make his career the way he wants it to be." You got to own that yourself. You got to shape it. You got to figure out. You got to set visions for yourself. And it's the same for college students, whatever it is. Like I used to play sport. It was the same in sport. It was those people who went back to the coach afterwards and go, "I didn't really get that. Will you show me that separately and maybe do some extra passing skills, whatever, to make it happen?" You got to make it happen for yourself. If you know that your negotiation skills are weak, then do something about it. Don't expect that you're going to miraculously get better overnight yourself just because you happen to be there. If you if you know that you need to learn well, whatever it is that, that you need in your workplace, then you have to go out there and find that knowledge yourself. You have to go out and actively grab hold of that skill and digest it yourself. Don't wait for it to happen passively because it's never going to. And then the next tip that goes really well with this one is don't wait to be told what to do. Start thinking for yourself. 
If your company is not offering the course or the training that you need, then go out and actively pursue it. Uh, I've mentioned YouTube. There is so much excellent teaching stuff on YouTube now. As far as students go, Khan Academy is absolutely brilliant, completely free and absolutely amazing. And there's so much stuff on business as well. Everybody is getting on the bandwagon of, of making their own YouTube channels to explain how to do this better or that better, including Slack that I discovered a couple of days ago. And it's all great stuff. It's all great stuff. And the, the nice thing about watching it on YouTube, of course, is that you can watch it at your own convenience. And if you don't get it the first time, you can watch it again. You get to see, you get to listen. You, it's, it's an excellent first step to learning a new skill or a new set of information. And I'm going to bring in a piece from Sartain's principle here because there's a piece that works really well, which was the advice your dad gave you. And that was that it doesn't take much to be better than everyone else. You just need to do a little bit more. That's right. Well, I think one of the problems that we have when we're learning, we want to learn too much too soon. Was it your interview that you did with Bruce the other week where you, he was talking about Matrix? Absolutely. And this is one of the, the things that I, I talk to people about as well, the idea, you know, when they plug N Neo in and he learns jujitsu in about 10 seconds. That's not reality. You cannot learn something in just a few days. And I think one of the biggest problems that we all have and this is not just for learning, it's, it's for pretty much everything. That, and it's the, the, the lovely little quote that we make our short-term goals far too high and our long-term goals far too low. We expect to do too much too soon, and yet we don't appreciate how far we can actually get if we just do a little bit every day. And so when, uh, when I was learning, learning about Slack, I say, right, okay, today, this morning, I'm just going to get on and explore around and just see what there is. It wasn't, I wasn't expecting to learn how to, to be proficient in it. It was just to explore. So you're not trying to do too much too soon because if you do try to do too much too soon, all you're going to do is get frustrated. And you're probably going to sit there at the end of the day saying, I told you so. I told you that I couldn't do it. It's too much. I can't do it. The next one I love, Dean, which was find out the answer to questions yourself. So I really laughed at this one, which I'll tell you in a second. But let's share this one first. In the old days, when people studied, they had no choice but to either listen to the teacher as the font of all knowledge, or if they were lucky, they, they could access a library. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about 100 years ago. And yet, the structure of a classroom and the way that, that we're expected to learn has pretty much stayed the same for the last 100 years or so. You look at a photograph of a lecture theater and then what the Greeks had, and it's pretty much the same sort of thing. And yet, the probability that the teacher knows more than the information that you can find on the web is zero. You can find out much more stuff on the internet than you can get from your teacher alone. And your teacher is just one person. Your access to your teacher or your lecturer or your trainer is very limited. And if you don't get it the first time and you have to ask your, your, your trainer again, you risk the idea of, you risk that, that you're going to look stupid in front of people. And so the, the idea of having a trainer or a teacher giving that information to the students is fundamentally flawed now with the situation that we have. The, I think one of the biggest skills that we could be teaching people is how to learn autonomously. You teach a student how to go and find the answer themselves. And that is, that's empowerment in, in the basic sense. 
that you're giving people this idea that they are capable of learning whatever it is that they want to learn. If you go back a step, you think about supposedly before a kid is five or something like that, they ask you 100 questions a day because that is the basis of learning. And then we stamp it out in kids. By middle school, kids don't ask questions anymore because the teachers always I need to stick to the curriculum. I need to follow the course formula here. And I don't have time to be answering questions, but that is how we are programmed to learn. And it's stamped out of us. So it's no wonder when people get to the workplace that they stop asking questions because it's seen as a bad thing. If you get on an airplane, you expect that the pilot has been taught how to fly. And if you go to a hospital, you expect that the surgeon has learned how to do surgery. And yet the bizarre thing is we set, we're sending hundreds of thousands of students to school and university and college and training sessions, whatever, every day, and we are not teaching them how to learn. We are not teaching students how to learn effectively. And I think this is the most bizarre thing in the 21st century. In a world where we have to change every year, there's new stuff coming out. This is the innovation show, yeah? It's all about learning new stuff, adapting, changing, innovating. In this sort of world, learning is the most important skill that you can have, surely. Absolutely. And in the workforce as well, because of the rate of change, we need to adapt so quickly. And, and I don't think we're ready for how quickly we're going to have to adapt in the future. And it's one of the reasons I love bringing this new information to the listener and your book on learning how to learn is really important in that. I wanted to mention, I, I laughed when I read this one about just go and find out the answers to yourself because actually it's coming up with the question, which is the valuable skill now. I used to run a team of people and we had a rule in the office that you didn't ask a question that was Google-able. So once it was available in Google, you didn't ask it like for sometimes silly, like where's the nearest post office? And if somebody broke the rule, we used this website. It's very funny. It's called Let Me Google That For You. And what it does is it videos you going into the Google search box, searching where's the closest not post office. And right. then it creates a bitly link out of it, short link out of it. So what we would do is somebody would go, Aiden, do you know where the closest post office is? And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, I'll send you a link. So I'd send them the bit.ly link and I'd go into Google and it'd be just like, Google at yourself in future, right? And uh, it became a kind of an ongoing joke in the office, but then it, it spread throughout the whole organization. And I was the jackass at the top of it who started off. Let's move on. The next one you talk about is dare to prepare. This, this, I think in, in the book, I, I use the example of when we, I'm speaking for myself here, when, when I go to a concert, I listen to the music that I know I'm going to be listening to at the concert. What's the point of that? Why am I listening to something that I can hear for free, and yet I'm going to be paying 50 quid to see it on stage? You know, where the, the acoustics are probably not going to be as good as when I listen to it on, on at home. And it's that. When you, given that you need time to assimilate ideas, if you've gone over some of those ideas before you have to sit down and study, then your mind is going to be more open to those ideas. If you know that you're going to be going to a training session on sales techniques, then if you can read up or do a bit of research into what it is that you're going to be covering, then when those ideas are explained to you in the session, they're going to re resonate more. They're, you're going to say, okay, right, I, I remember that bit. And they'll anchor better. They'll stick in your mind better. And this idea of when you plant a seed, you prepare the earth so that the seed goes into the earth and has a better chance of growing. And this idea of preparing yourself mentally before you sit down to study hard, if you like, can make that difference. So with students, if you know that you're going to be studying nuclear fusion or whatever, 
then if you can do a bit of research before the class, the chance of you taking more away from that class is going to be much greater. The next one I loved as well, which is the sooner the better. This makes absolute sense. I am one of the world's experts in forgetting stuff. I have, I have a fantastically bad memory. And so we, we have this idea that we, when we have something in front of us and it's obvious, we think that in a week's time, it's still going to be obvious to us. And I, I've given up that idea. I, I, I have learned a long time ago that whatever it is that somebody's explaining to me or trying to teach me, I'm going to forget it by next week. And so the idea is that after you've had a class or a meeting or a conversation and there's important stuff that you don't want to forget, then act on it immediately. Don't wait for an hour to say, oh, well, I'll put it in my diary after lunch. Oh, I've got an important phone call, so I'll make a note of it after the phone call. Just assume that you're going to forget. We forget a phenomenal amount of stuff almost immediately after we've listened to a class. Uh, I think the, the statistics say something like we retain about 5 to 10% of what it is that we hear. So anybody, who, for instance, who's listening to this podcast says, right, these are important things that I want to take away. Then, then write them down now. Don't wait until later. Don't assume that because it's obvious to you now that in a week's time it's still going to be obvious because in a week's time you'll be thinking, oh, what was it that, that I heard? Uh, there was a few ideas there, but I, I can't remember what they were. People ask me about the show and preparing for each episode. And ever since I started reading books, and I only really started reading properly towards the end of my professional rugby career, and what I did was, you know, when you read and then you go back over the page and kind of go, oh, sh I already read this page. It's a horrible feeling, right? So I went, when that started having me at the start, I went, okay, I'm going to start taking notes. So I took notes on the book I was reading. Yep. And <laughs> then I would read over those notes before I read the next chapter. And it, it just, it's almost like, okay, where was I? And it brings you back to that point. And that's what I do with the show. Like when I'm reading a chapter, I take out bits and it's really helpful because then I get to interview you and talk to you about that. That reinforces the learning. And then I write an article where I bring parts of the book into life and that reinforces it again. And then I edit the show, which reinforces again. So it's an absolutely amazing way to learn. And it does exactly what you're saying. It's just taking little bits, little by little, like you say in Sorite's principle, you're adding up and all of a sudden you've built a mountain of knowledge. Absolutely. The trick that I use is when I read, I read with a pencil. The important bits, you know, the little nuggets of information that are the key points to what, what I'm reading, I'll just underline it very faintly with a pencil. If I find that I've got to the bottom of a page and I've underlined nothing, that's when your, your mind has slipped. And you're doing the reading, but you're not taking any of it in. Often I get to the bottom of a page and I think, what is it that I've just read? I can't remember any of it. It makes sense. You know, when the book is tattered and worn, it means that you've used it. We're going to finish up. We didn't get near the 23 tips. And there's more than 23, by the way, for the listener. There's more than 23 tips in the book. There's bonus tips here and there. And the, you bring pieces of Sorotis principle into the 23 tips as well. Ian, if people want to get in touch, how can they find you, the book, etc.? Anybody who wants to find me can get in touch with me through my website, which is iangibbs.es. It's a Spanish website. You can get me on LinkedIn. I'm an avid LinkedIn supporter. So anyone who wants to connect, connect with me, Ian Gibbs on LinkedIn, that'd be great. Author of 23 Tips to Learn Stuff Better so you can spend less time studying and more time enjoying yourself. Ian Gibbs, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Aidan. It's been a pleasure.